stream yards weird uh let's just start it from here one two three hi matt hello jason uh i am jason marinchuk my guest here is matthew erickson from the king pilled podcast we are from the internet and we are here to help you by continuing our reading series of patchwork and combining it with our concept our developing concept of the civilizational capital we come to you with a tale of two cities essentially uh two city brands two city corporations two major companies located one located in montreal canada the other located in texacana i don't know all over texas is bucky's everywhere oh yeah yeah and it's yeah. it's in several other states here in the general south as well oh really okay so it's mm -hmm. it's it's expensive i just kind of was like looking at its general financials this morning um these are interesting stories and then we'll go of course get into the reading uh chapter two profit strategies for our new corporate overlords by Mencius Bullbug, aka curtis yarvin uh written for on november 20th 2008 uh, of course that's from patchwork the political system 21st century uh i know there's some people who uh just really don't like yarvin and so this has been difficult for them to to sit through or get through what I would suggest, what I would say is that um, it, it's it's not so much being Yarvin stands for this stuff. It's it's that Matt and I are starting to see certain patterns, especially uh, with what we're calling or what's being called the PayPal mafia. Uh, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, both uh, there's a whole bunch of guys, and they're making moves. And the moves a lot of them, a lot of times they're making, are uh, seemingly developing in third world countries this kind of concept of patchwork uh we'll see what happens with el salvador but certainly there's there's a, a company called prospera who's doing renovations basically citywide renovations in honduras and a few other countries like that so to go back to chapter one where um yarvin says i'm trying to get the exact quote um Uh, where is it? To start the hype machine, is that it? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the phrase. Yeah, to start the hype machine, let's just say that if anyone can build anything like patchwork, even a tiny crude third world ripoff of patchwork, it's all over for the democratic regimes. It'll be like East Germany competing with West Germany. Funnily enough, the financial relationship between... Okay, anyways. So uh, we're, we're, I think we're starting to see this start to go online uh and when you're in that position of seeing these things you're kind of presented with a choice and the choice is we can sit here and bitch about it and criticize it or we can try to uh, involve ourselves with it in whatever way possible uh and that's where civilizational capital comes in uh and uh yeah any thoughts i was on thinking that? Anyway. <clears throat> i was thinking one of the ways I've kind of visualized how I'm thinking about what I'm going about doing. Cause I want to make sure that the things I'm doing aren't stupid and, and pointless and a waste of time. I want to make sure that I'm making smart decisions, looking at reality, engaging with reality as it is. And so I've been kind of imagining this as, um, do you ever read one of these like historical books that goes back through and dives into a really specific period of time and they look at all the different elements different threads that came together to eventually lead to the events that came to pass so they're right. starting with a they like they already knew know what happened so they're they're dealing with the facts on the ground and they're able because they know where things are going they're able to look and see the different threads and pick out how they relate to each other and, and, and get to that point so it's come, it's almost kind of like we're doing like a like a a, a post mortem history of something that hasn't happened yet. We're sort of mm -hmm. looking at how these different influences have come together and what they and but then the the fact that we're not looking at history actually we're looking at something that's still in the future. If if we're it's it's not simply that we're just trying to make predictions about the future. It's that we're imagining if things were going to go in this general direc direction, what would it look like? And then here, it looks like we have a lot of things that correspond with that, indicating that we're going in this general direction. So let's start going in that direction, not just look at where the puck is going, but start skating toward the puck. So in order to do that, then we need to have a, 
a, a map. Like we need to be able to to understand the territory and then figure out how what we're doing maps onto the territory. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's uh, you need principles. You 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 see like was, we'll get into Bombardier story in a second. Bombardier starts off as a repair shop eighty five years ago and develops into a major aerospace transportation uh, production company worth billions of dollars. It, it's international. And and then hits hard times and collapses. But you would see that this there must be at some point a, a regio, something that's holding that company together, a vision as it proceeds up and, and begins to become what it, what it eventually becomes. The the issue always is is that you you begin you start becoming reactionary at some point like if you lose that vision if you lose that o- overall sense of being then you you open yourself up to reactionary forces of the market or just of things going on and that's where you start making uh, that's where your potential making mistakes just goes almost infinite because now you're no longer saying this is who we are and this is what we're doing and this is what we're trying to achieve and these are the directions and goals we're 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 interested in this is okay we've achieved all these goals and now we're just going to try to maintain this thing hopefully and be or just keep on taking more more contracts even though we can't fulfill them and eventually <laughs> collapse and have to sell off <laughs> pretty much everything uh we'll get into that story in a second compare that to something like bucky's where it's like no this is who we are this is what we are this is it you know and you can get expansion you can start like i don't know how many they they only started off with one jerky bin and now have 12 i don't know right but the the concept and the and the the, like i said the regio that holds bucky's together is as i'm going to assume has been the same since it's open in the 80s and they're certainly they're expanding and becoming more competitive and and finding ways of of expand of of asserting their principles into the world and being competitive, but there's still always Bucky's, and there's something solid there that people understand, and that creates that vibe. This is the 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 thing that we're really trying to capture here in this series, and and it's it's the hardest one to really you, either you get it or you don't. Is that what we're presenting is really a vibe? You know, you know, you know it when you're when you're when you're in it. You know it when you're accessing it, uh, and it's undeniable. Like a civilization is a civilization. <laughs> you know, like we like we can get poetic and and write thousands and thousands of words of proof of it, but it's more like you know what you know it when you're standing in it, and when you're not standing in it, you damn well know too, right? Like, uh, I think that's the the teal deer on this whole thing is that uh is that it's it's not just a matter of functionality or buildings or trains or something like things that civilization doesn't doesn't have things the civilization has things because it's a civilization and those things those things produce civilizational capital that that feeds back into the civilization so the civilization can create more things that are reflective of the civilization and so on and so on and so on so it becomes paradoxical in that in that in that domain. There's a term that I was I was just trying to look it up and see if I could get like a technical definition of it, and I couldn't find it. So I'll just have to fend for myself. Uh, Yarvin actually is the one. He, some he uses it somewhere in, I want to say maybe open letter or how Dawkins got pwned. Uh, he uses the term ant smell. Something has a particular mm. ant smell, which is like the an ant can smell another ant and tell if that ant is part of his tribe or the other tribe. They could look exactly identical, but there's a they the animals have like an an innate sense of who's part of your tribe and who's not. And it could be pheromones, it could be you know energy frequencies. Who knows what it actually is? But that there is a there there. You can instinctively know when you encounter someone or something that has the 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 vibe of someone that is our thing that's us like you were talking about bucky's yesterday that you can just look at their branding you can look at the way they've set up their business and some of the key choices that they've made and you know exactly what this person's political persuasion is or at least right. what kind of organization they're creating and what sort of political persuasion that organization has what values it's going to appeal to you could just 
like we were describing this to you to, to you uh, last night, obviously. So you grew up in Eastern Canada and you live in Australia. No idea what Bucky's is. Never even heard it before last night. <clears throat> and a few of us there are in Texas or in there's, there's 47 locations total, uh, 34 in Texas, four in Alabama, two each in Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee, and one each in Kentucky, Mer- Missouri, and South Carolina, but started in Texas. And we started describing it to you, just describing the way that the the place is laid out and everything. And, um, and we, I guess we could go into that in more detail if you want for people who don't have any idea what Bucky's is. As soon as we described it to you, you were like, oh, this is a place that if you showed up and someone was starting to get beat up in the parking lot or something, like anybody who's there is going to be like, no, this isn't going to fly. Like this is Bucky's. We don't do this in, in Bucky's. If you want to take that shit, go somewhere else and do that. Nobody's going to be doing drug dealers, d- drug deals in the Bucky's parking lot. Yeah, go to the, the drug dealers down themselves, the street. The drug dealers themselves wouldn't do it. Even if it was the perfect location, like they're just going to be like, that's just not our place. We shouldn't be there. And when you're there, like you said, you could be a complete and total foreigner, and this is the first time you've been there. And something about the ethos of the place, when you step onto the property, you know now, like you would go go get in a fight, like 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 submitting somebody who is acting out or something, even if you just drove up for the first time. There's something about mm-hmm. the place that has this this it has an ant smell to it. Yeah, I mean, we're just, I'm just showing some pictures on the screen here. Uh, obviously, they've. I mean, this is a bigger one. I'm sure there's different size locations. But they got to they got a beaver that's a mascot. Pretty standard, that's a pretty standard Bucky's. Beavers just keep coming up on this one ever since Jay Burton. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I think beavers, beavers and civilization uh, capital are 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 married together. We're we're going to uh-huh. take it from building. Uh, yeah. Um, they got the mascots. I mean, it's very. This opened up in '82. It's got a very '82. Could be '60s. Could be '80s. That kind of that kind of feel to if it. If it was in black and white, um, I would totally believe it was the sixties. This is from their official website. I love it. It's like the world's cleanest restrooms, cleanest restrooms in America. I like that. Th- th- there you go. <laughs> and, and so to someone who doesn't know what Bucky's is, <laughs> this is a technically a convenience store that also serves. It has its own barbecue restaurant. It yeah, this- serves its own beef jerky. It has, um, uh, it sells charcoal grills. It sells camping equipment. It sells clothes. They have their own clothing line. It sells art. Like, like a corner of it looks like Hobby Lobby. Um, it, it, it just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, an experience just to walk in there. But they also have bathrooms, and all of their the the stations have eighty to one hundred and twenty fuel pumps, and then the bathrooms to facilitate. A, uh, a a place that large, the the largest uh, convenience stores in the world are, are Bucky's. Um, yeah, see if you can find a huge. picture. Yeah, those are fuel pumps there on the right. Right, and then that's the it's the size of a of a like a grocery store, like I don't know, uh, like a, a, a um, what do you call it? a Kroger grocery store. See if you can find a picture of the bathrooms because the bathrooms are like. Uh, the types of bathrooms you would expect to find at like a really fancy concert hall. Each stall is fully like floor to ceiling, completely its own enclosed room. And there there's, I don't know, probably 50 of them per bathroom. And they're all immaculately clean. There's someone whose job is there to just be going through and cleaning the bathrooms constantly and keeping them absolutely spotless. The only downside is there's bad cell cell phone reception in all the, uh, Bucky's bathrooms that I've been in. <laughs> See here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Which I mean, if you, you think about it, these, these are basically like off the highway. I would assume, like, I'm, yeah, I'm just oh saying, yeah, like, it's like a, cleanest. it's like a truck stop. Right. So imagine like the world's cleanest truck stop. Yeah. And that says something with no eighteen wheelers allowed. You 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 cannot bring an eighteen wheeler onto the property. That's interesting, right? So you so get again, no lot but again, but but again, principle saying like, look, we understand that that if we allow this, then we also allow everything else that comes with this. So we're saying, and you know, financially, it's a, it's it must be a hit. But they're like, yeah, you know, sometimes it's not about money. Sometimes it's about vibe. We need to retain mm-hmm. the vibe because if, if we bring the trucks in, sure, we make more money off the trucks, but then we then this goes away. Right. Or this becomes a way, or then we have to put even more uh, capital into maintaining this. And we like this. 
this is us this this says this says us now right here's the answer now clean bathrooms let me find if i have it um piss and shit air airlines while you're looking for that the pay scale for bucky's so this is a this is a convenience store it's paid weekly uh no experience necessary cashier gift maintenance warehouse and grocery stockers make 16 bucks an hour um, and this is this is in Texas where minimum wage, the functional minimum wage is probably like 11 bucks an hour, something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what the actual minimum wage is. Uh, food service and car wash is 19 bucks an hour. Team lead is 18 to 21. Department manager is 23 to 31. Full time, 35 to 50 hours. Assistant general managers make 100K plus. Car wash managers make 125K plus. Food service managers make 175K plus. And general managers make 225K plus. They also get uh, 401k, 100% match up to 6%, three weeks paid time off that you can use, cash or roll it. Um, and then they also have health care. And then uh, you make an extra two bucks an hour for overnight. So you can make like genuinely half decent money for like the, the normal working class person working at a Bucky's. Yeah, no, that's that's those are insanely good wages for the work you're doing, really. And what does that do? Well, you're retaining your top staff. Anyone who's who works really hard to get good at that job is staying around because they're like, hey, maybe I can be a regional manager someday, or I can I can manage one of these stores, right? These guys aren't gonna be around forever. I'm working my way up. And in that process, you just get become better and better. <laughs> you're producing more and more capital for them constantly. Mm-hmm. The, the root of all this is human capital. That's where it all starts. So each individual person, you, me, and everyone listening to this has human capital. What's where you invest your time and your energy and your skills into. But there has to be a desire for that investment and the, and, and almost a promise of return. And that promise of return usually has to be pretty de- usually pretty good com- or commiserate with the skill, energy, and, uh, and so on that you're putting into it. So... Yeah, you take something like Bucky's, you're like, well, you know, they could get away. Like, there's tons of models out there with with lesser models, but then you, those are the the convenience stores that you kind of want to avoid after a certain hour, you know, or you know, you don't bring the kids there because you know there's street walkers and and methed out people in the parking lot, and you got to and you got to go deal with that, you know. Um, Bucky's is a convenience store that I would gladly take a toddler into at two o'clock in the morning, like right not even a hint of a thought about it uh just to give you an to a stark contrast we're talking about bathrooms here is a video that's making rounds it was a flight from pakistan to london i believe yeah fl- british airways flight from pakistan to london I don't I don't know how this happens. Like how Well, you do. I mean, I do. Yes. But I mean, even then, like I know the 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 what is it? Like the proximate cause of how it happens, but I don't know the mechanism of that proximate like I don't, I I just don't have the, I can't wrap my mind around being in a social place like that that does something like that. Well, it's volume. This is why the primal frame, when introduced into the civilizational frame, tends to win out. It's not because it's more stronger, even more uh, vibrant, or has more more going on with it. Is its volume? It can it can overwhelm the system. So in that scenario, if you're a flight attendant, at some point you just give up because you're like, what? I mean, where do we start? Like, okay, I got to clean up all the piss and shit on the floor, and then I got to like clean up all the things in the oh screw it right and you're getting paid dick money and you're working for british airways which is like you know you got to go through gender reassignment courses and you know <laughs> watch your pronouns and all these other things stack up to a point where you're like eh, not my job you know just right. get us we just uh peanuts you want a peanuts you know, you know some more curry i don't know out of the bucket slop i don't know Pushing a trough of curry down the down the, the airplane, right down the aisle, and then you like you, you hit a bunch of turbulence, and the curry just goes everywhere, and the crowd goes wild. 
because it's like a, it's like oh like a festival day ah. <laughs> i'm painting jason with this visual <laughs> just makes me want to puke um <laughs> yeah i mean and that's how you get it right that's the british airways airplanes you know i i i, I don't have it set up but i mean it, you can easily just go back to look at what what did airplane what did air travel look like in the 1950s Mm-hmm. not that <laughs> in yeah. fact those people wouldn't be allowed on the plane and it's not uh-huh. because it was a racial thing I mean in the 1950s it would have been a racial thing but it would also have been like no no yeah no. we don't want our plane to smell like that no you see the images of like flights from the the 60s where like the entire plane is basically like first class and right there's yeah. like a a, a beautiful yeah. steward yeah. Who's and like, like their roast steak? And, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine how successful an airline would be that ran that way? That 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 said, this is what it's the entire thing's going to be first class. If you could figure out a way to to make that um, feasible economically, it would be the most successful company in the world. <laughs> You would think that though, but the problem is, is, is the people now because you don't have the pe- you don't have the right people for that anymore, or you do. But they're, to, they're 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 all fly, flying private anyways. Right, right. So you have to it has to be priced priced high because I mean that's essentially what a private yeah. how a how a private flight is. So if you could figure right. out a way to 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 bring that down or create some sort of barrier to to getting someone into that, then I mean. In the West, you can't do it because it would be you'd be automatically branded sexist, racist, culturalists, yada yada, white supremacist airlines, and you know automatically because you'd have to be put it something called a standard in, like no, you smell, no. Mm-hmm. It, you, in fact, y'all do, y'all, all y'all from here, yeah, y'all smell bad, like it's bad. What you so what you have to do is you have to incorporate something. Because to me, that's like, okay, so this just means there's another problem we've got to try to solve here. So mm-hmm. the way you do it is you come up with wh- what is the thing that would be perfectly legal to include as a feature that would dissuade those types of people from wanting to be there. Classical I first thought music, wouldn't be but... fully successful classical music playing, um, requiring a dress code, like having a, a, a really elevated dress code. That's the sort of thing that could be gamed, but... If you had enough of those elements to it, then those types of people just wouldn't wouldn't sign up. You'd have to make it more expensive so you wouldn't get the people who just show up there because it's the cheapest option, but you wouldn't have to max out the price on it. If you introduced a few of those kinds of things and you like like Bucky's, you demonstrate this is us. These are the people we want here. Then you would get that thing. People would be policing other people in in that sort of environment. Yeah, I mean that's but that's the the kind of culture you need to have substantiated before you can do any of these things, um, whether it's from it's substantiated from from before a time and it it carries over, uh, even with the external pressures, or you basically recreate uh, a new culture. Like I would mm-hmm. think it would be probably easier at this point to do, uh, let's say, a private airline, a semi-private airline with that kind of service, but having it apply a certain route, right? And just mm-hmm. kind of establish that, you know, uh, like here in Australia, there's a town not too far here, but that flies, does now doing flies up into the mines. Well, imagine mm-hmm. if you did that, did a, but it did like a five-star service kind of thing just for th- those those employees and, the, and you know, and executives flying up to the mines and stuff like that. Okay, now you're substantiating something because you're working within a, within a group. And within mm-hmm. the within the group that's already like an in like a uh, preferential in group, now you can start to uh, uh, put stipulations and principles in there, and they're going to get along with it because like they're, they're yeah I want to sit and have my roast beef like, fuck you right you know Charlie put your feet down right um, it, it, I think that would be the more elegant solution to do you know where the place what the than, route would be you would want to do the route from say Austin to North Dakota because mm. North Dakota is exploding right now with um uh the trades like there's trades work up there where right. they're trying to get people up there they're paying entry level tradesmen like 115 grand a year 
because they're just trying to lure people up there because there's so much development happening. So if you get Austin, mm -hmm. which is increasingly becoming a larger and larger business hub, and you connect it with up there, that's going to be a high traffic zone anyways, because you're going to get the people who are um, doing the projects and the people who are funding the projects going back and forth. And then you can begin populating North Dakota, which I'm sure the North Dakota people probably wouldn't want to wouldn't want to be a part of. But I mean, hey, they don't get a vote in this system. This you is can, not a democracy. You can be populated by us, or you can be populated by them. You you, right. you get to pick. Yeah, we'll right. we'll build some nice things. Here's the problem, right? Like you mean, yeah. maybe you don't like my face too much. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. But like, oh, look at the cool bank I'm going to build you. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, like, right, yeah. yeah we're we're going to build some bridges, my friend. It'll be, it'll be fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about Bombardier, and then we so we did Bucky's uh, to give you the the uh, the counterpoint, and this is kind of how something can, can kind of fall. Uh, this is from 2020. <clears throat> How the once mighty Bombardier became politically toxic in Quebec. So to give you a bit of background, Bombardier uh, is, well, I mean, it still is an aerospace and transport. They have they're involved in, in trains and planes. Uh, I don't think any automobiles at the time. Uh, they got in trouble about 10 years ago when they started having that's uh, a lot of the products they were putting out were having equipment failures um, and a few other notable uh, crit uh, critiques. And they also started getting backlogged in orders. So they were accepting a lot of contracts and then not being able to fulfill them. Uh, pretty, I mean, pretty dramatically. I, I don't have the articles here, but um, they were backlogged like massively. And because of that, it started having to get bailouts um, so this is from 2020. Bombardier has reported a $1.6 billion loss for 2019. It is leaving the commercial aviation business and has sold off its remaining stake in the A220 uh, program. Formerly knows that C series, that's uh, in, in conjunction with Airbus. Um, and we'll go through this here, but again, to kind of the, the big thing I want to concentrate on here is in Quebec, where Bombardier was is as much a historic institution as an economic one, it seemed like Many to a fire uh, seemed like many like a fire sale was on. What would be left of the global empire that began in Valcour, Quebec, a repair shop, eighty three years ago? So that's an, that's the interesting thing, right? So this um, this company, which in twenty twenty is around ten billion dollars in in uh, U.S. in debt, and has basically had to sell off almost all its divisions in order to keep afloat. Uh, I have a Forbes article from from this year to to uh, to, uh, to look at. But you go from a small little repair shop, you get into snowmobiles, uh, and then you keep going and going and going, and then you're building planes and trains and all these other transports uh, and becoming a global brand. And then through mismanagement, through that, through not being able to have that uh, idea of what to do next, it becomes this, well, we just keep doing the thing we're doing. But over time, maybe you start doing that a little bit less competently. Maybe your human capital goes down a bit. Uh, either through decision making or through your staffing or God knows what, and what ends up happening is you go from uh, a repair shop to an international brand and now to a hollowed out husk. Here's a report from Forbes, which is basically saying that they've kind of rebounded now uh, with a new CEO. What they don't detail in the Forbes article is that they basically uh, gutted the company. So, where is it here? In 2020, the company unveiled a major restructuring plan aimed at reducing its multi-billion dollar debt and consolidating its focus on its core aviation business, such as business jets. This involves selling off its regional jet program to Mitsubishi uh, Heavy Industries, its aerostructures division to Spirit Aerosystems, and its rail division to French train maker Alsum. So, like, essentially, most of its companies, it's now just doing private uh, mini jets for essentially for private buyers. That's what it's been reduced to. And it's still billions of dollars in debt. Because I think right now they're saying that they made an estimate nine billion in annual revenue last year, which is up from six point nine billion, which sounds great, but 
they're ten billion dollars in debt, uh, estimated, and that's being offset by massive bailouts from the Quebec government. You know, so probably without those those bailouts, they'd be what maybe fifteen, twenty, who knows how many billion dollars in debt. And sure, okay, you've restru- you've sold off, you've fought a whole bunch of people, you've restructured, but you're still not dealing with your with your in- internal capital issue. And now you're just holding the line and hoping that private the private jet sales will keep you keep you functioning. But it's I don't think it's enough. Like you you don't it's almost like getting a, a promotion. You can't depromote somebody without firing them. You can't bring someone up to regional manager and go, ah, it's not working out. Peter Principal just came in, Bob. Sorry, we're 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 dropping you back down. That guy's gonna quit. Guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this it's the same kind of thing in businesses where that which goes up will come down. And there's very few cases, I think, of anyone who gets caught in the middle and goes, oh, we, wait, wait, we, we can make this work. BlackBerry is a, is a great one too, right? Mm-hmm. Where they become everything and screw up and they're gone. <laughs> they're just, they're gone. Uh, and there's no saving it. Any thoughts on that before we get to the reading? It's just remarkable. And first of all, very interesting parallel between these two companies. It's not exactly the same. I mean, talking about like manufacturing and and uh, operation of extraordinarily large uh, uh, devices is very very different from I don't know running a barbecue stand. But sure. Bucky's and Bombardier are both like both of them are taking on the world. Both of them are trying to. They're not just focusing on one single core offering. They both offered uh, a variety, a whole expanse of things. Like like Bucky's is a gas station. It's also a like a Hobby Lobby. It's also a sporting goods and hunting and camping goods uh, distributor. It's 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 got a whole bunch of different things. Then they've got a little restaurant. In, they've got a fudge. They've got all kinds of stuff. To keep 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 in mind with Bucky's too, they're making. I think their last annual report was six hundred seventy five million dollars thereabouts. Uh, maybe yes, yeah, six between six and seven hundred million um, is what I can find out. Uh, but they're also in a highly competitive market. Like you have came, you have a, what is it? Seven uh, Eleven. You have <laughs> Come and Go, which is my favorite. Um, <laughs> I just like they listed off all their competitors. Like that's a packed market of major major international brands. There's 7-Eleven just up the street for me. So with all the marketing and all everything that, you know, presence and uh, buying power and everything. So that this company that has been around for since 82, which is almost like, uh, I don't think it's family owned, but you know, it's, it's small in comparison has carved out a huge part of the market. And that's kind of going into what we're saying too. You don't have to go from zero to a hundred. We just have to go to zero to one. And but you have to admit that we're at zero right now. We don't live in a civilization. And it's not just I'm saying that to be salacious or, or, or confrontational. It's like you got to start there. You got to you, you have to admit you're at zero in order to figure out what you're doing. Because if you start thinking like actually no, we're at five, it's like, okay, if you're at five, then then here's what people at five do. Here's mm-hmm. what all the things you you would be, you would just be doing, and you wouldn't even be thinking. You wouldn't need us if you're at five. But you're not at five. We're at zero, and I'm being nice about that because <laughs> we're probably at probably in negative interest. Sorry, I interrupt. Go ahead, Lynn. Well, and if you think building off of that, and then I have one other, one other related thought. If you uh, if you're going from zero, it, so if you're at zero and you act like you're at zero, then you're good to go. If you're at five and you act like you're at zero, you're good to go. If you're at zero and you act like you're at five, then you're like a company acting as if it has revenue that it doesn't have. And sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can you can um, build your company through debt. You can you can operate at a loss for a period of time. But in order to do that, requires a significant amount of existing capital, which kind of says you're that. If the existing capital is there, then you're not actually at zero. We don't have the existing capital, so we necessarily have to be at zero. So we have to act as if we're at zero. We have to recognize we're at zero. We don't live in a in a civilization. We live in a jungle. And our jungle has a whole bunch of different primitive tribes that are all competing for resources. 
most of them have lost the ability to produce resources. So we're, we're, we're scrambling around for the resources that are laying around on the ground and we're gradually accumulating all of them. But nobody's building new resources. Very few tribes are actually engaged in the process of generating new resources. So we have to recognize that that's where we are. We may, we may have fancy technology, but really these are just like hyper advanced rocks that we are continuing to hit each other with just the same way like ancient tribes would hit each other with rocks. So I think when you recognize that, then number one, you become a lot less surprised when various different things happen. You don't have to get all bent out of shape about each new appalling thing the president said, or, you know, you know, this new scandal that arose, or look how the media is lying about this. Well, yeah, like this is you're, if you expected it to be otherwise, that you don't understand the world that you live in right now. So just recognize how the world is and focus your effort and energy on actually beginning to build a civilization. The other thing was regarding Bombardier, it is, I've been doing a lot of like, like listening to venture capitalists and um, thinking about investing and, and all these different, different things. So I'm, I have like one foot in the political world and then one foot in the business world. And listening to successful business people talk about business and the way that you realize these are like actual human beings that they sit here and they talk and then they go and they have a life and they have coworkers and they have bosses and they have um, subordinates and they're making decisions. And these aren't, these aren't people who are out here um, trying to conceive of ways to make things worse. These are all people who are out there trying to, to, to be successful with their job and be productive and generate things and have a good life and make friends. And they're, they're, they're engaged in this process. Bombardier, to have a company fall off that badly, get that detached from itself, where you have the executives are getting massive payouts, and yet they're taking on all these government contracts and just simply not doing anything with them. So like, what are all these people doing? They're all around each other. They're all engaged in work every day. They're all taking salaries. And these contracts are coming in and just like piling up on someone's desk or, and then the, like the technicians are out there just like, like playing hacky sack or something, you know, like how, how do you get an organization of people that becomes this completely detached from one another with stakes this high? Like, how would you not have someone running around inside there with their hair on fire? Like, like we are billions of dollars in debt and we're about to get investigated by the federal government and, and, you know, it it it's it is just mind blowing to imagine that you could have a company that's just trundling along like that, and everyone inside is just whatever you know. What what do you go home and talk to your wife about after work? Like like, what do you tell her? You know, oh, we got a new contract today, and I tossed it in the corner, and then you know watched YouTube or something. I don't. It, it just blows my mind. Like I could understand this at the you know, I was a service writer in a, in a heavy machinery dealership before. And I spent a lot of time watching YouTube while I was at work, but you know, we weren't, we weren't an international business, uh, uh, manufacturing and shipping like the largest uh, pieces of equipment in the world. <laughs> You're muted. I think that's an important part too, there too, is that it's all about scale, right? Like you can almost forgive the podunk small business for not you know maybe the employees not taking things as seriously or you you have growth issues and all that stuff the ones who will succeed are the ones who apply and 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 have that uh, regio that principle that vision of what's going forward of what we're doing and how we're investing and what we're building this into but you can excuse the small guys a little bit uh, when you get into things like Bombardier, who started off small and, and got to this point, like you've gone through all the evolutionary stages to get to this thing. You should be attracting the most highly competent, highly talented, most most aggressive, you know, uh, people who want to succeed and go, I'm going to attach myself to this and you and and learn what I can and, and either go up the ladder or get my skills so I can go off and do with something else. Like that's what you should be attracting and what you're when apparently what you're attracting are people who just show up and do minimal amounts of work and no one in the system because basically it gets to the point where like well we're, we're just bombardier we're at we're at 10 we're always going to be a 10 we're a 10 rank you know we're a 10 10 ranks uh, a company but then you wake up one day and you realize oh no we're a two shit <laughs> we're a two that's been acting like a 10 
what do we do now? Well, we start acting like a like a like a two, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. Our whole our whole thing gets sold off for parts, and right. we're going to focus. And what's incredible is that thing they're expecting nine billion dollars in revenue this next year, which is which is like almost fifty percent more than their previous year, and so they went from having all of these different divisions and making six point nine billion or whatever it was. And now with one single division, they're projecting nine billion. That just highlights right. just how profoundly incompetent and unproductive they were being. This is this is a fall from a ten to a negative infinity. Right. I, it, it just blows my mind that you. I mean, it's one thing to be like kind of sort of incompetently run, and then you just fall off and ah, you're terrible. But to go from top of the world, like humming like a well-oiled machine to degrading to that point is is yeah. phenomenal. You know there was people who were there that entire time. They were they were standing shoulder to shoulder with Boeing in other major brands. <laughs> I I didn't read this part of it. I always I still have it here. Uh I might close the, the tab, but the CEO was saying like, "Oh yeah, you know, it's it's difficult, you know, we of course have competition, large, large uh, competitions within Canada with, you know, Air Canada and so on and uh and, they, and you know and they're heavily government subsidized. I'm like, you're heavily government subsidized, asshole. Like, <laughs> what? Ninety <laughs> percent of your PR problem was how heavily subsidized you were in times of economic downturn. The Quebec government's like bailing you out. Uh, the Quebec and the Canadian government's bailing you out of the tune of like you know billions of dollars. Like, what? <laughs> and you this did should that. be Look, this should be a white know, pill like, too. Because yeah. like this is what happens when you have the organization that's completely incompetent, run by people who are totally out of touch, and um, completely squandering their resources and generating nothing new. Eventually, it it comes home, which means mm -hmm. that that organization ceases to exist. This is the natural way yeah. of the world. Organizations that are run incompetently do not continue running and get more and more powerful. They degenerate and they degenerate and they degenerate until they collapse. Well, this and this is the bitter white pill. Is, we'll do this little bit of a response to the people, you know, the, the Illuminati people, the all the WEF and all these people are so powerful and everything like that, right? And you know, I I can understand why the narrative is that way and and why people believe that. And certainly, there might be historical precedents for it. The great thing about that we have the bitter white pill in twenty twenty four is that all of our you know the the horrible evil elite people are fucking retarded. <laughs> They're fucking retarded. They're old on drugs and retarded and the people replacing them those hand-picked individuals are also fucking or retarded worse. <laughs> yeah. or worse no one likes them they always pull up that little weird guy who's like well you know the, the useless eaters who are gonna like no one look at that dude do you honestly think that when he goes to like davos that people want to sit at his table no they're put there they're like oh we gotta sit next to creepy creep fuck like like no one wants to be around that guy He's weird. He's into weird shit. You know he's into weird shit. You just look at him like mm, that guy does weird. That they, those hookers get paid well. I'm just saying like, <laughs> you know, it's, they're working overtime. Um, and it would be yeah. one thing if there was nothing competent happening. If there were no competent right. people, there was no there was nothing else being built. If that was the case, then I mean I would still say that it's not very useful to to just. Um, uh, deify your enemies and ascribe to them superpowers that they don't have. Um, but the the fact that there are competent things being built, there are competent people doing things. And you have to, and you don't have to think these people are your friends. You just have to recognize that these people are building things that are actually going to last, that are actually going to be mm -hmm. sustainable, that are actually going to outcompete the existing things that suck. This is this is the story of human history. Like history didn't start 60 years ago or 80 years ago. In a lot of ways it's like World War II is the is not just the founding myth for the the shit libs. World War II is the founding myth for like everyone right now. Mm -hmm. Even even our guys are still acting as if World War II is the founding myth. No, there's a whole lot of there's a whole hell of a lot of history before World War II and we can learn from that well, history too. Our guys will be are a bit smarter, so they'll they'll, they'll do the starting block at World War One and World, World War One, yeah. Right, yeah, right, right. Everything before that What's was that? just people in slaves in chains. There was no prosperity. Everyone was enslaved all the time. Didn't you know that, Matt? Like, right, right. They just they squeaked out Sistine chapels and and uh, 
great works of art throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century and all that stuff uh, by, by slavery. It was just human slavery chattel. Yeah, they're just whipping them bondage. until they built that, until they perfectly carved that uh, that ornate. Beautiful images. Right, right, right. Right, <laughs> right yeah. Or And had the culture that would substantiate it and, and maintain it throughout throughout time. Right, yeah. You know, right. Uh, well, we what, were talking but, about how I probably shouldn't put these these words together completely, so I'll just kind of allude yeah. to it. But we were talking yesterday on on the voice chat about the um, the utility of the S word with respect to managing the prison problem. That it's actually right. a very useful alternative. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and again, I'm just, I'm at a point now where I think everything's on the table. Mm -hmm. Right. We're in a period of 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 uh, uh of chaos the, the chaos has gone on too long we're in we're in anarchy as father servant rose uh accurately predicted we are in the age of anarchy and the only thing that can come out of anarchy is complete collapse or something coming out of it that's more positive positive. and i think putting everything on the table and examining everything uh in a neutral space and simply saying okay what can work what can't work what do we need you know like you know of course we need to have morality of course you know we're, we're orthodox christians we're, we're always going to approach things from that front of mind like there are certain things that we won't even it won't even cross our minds uh and that's a good thing but in terms of functionality in terms of how do we produce capital and how do we invest it and how do we get from zero to one well then if we're if you're if your starting gate is no we can't have any of that none of this stuff can possibly work all the things that have worked for thousands of years no 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 you know absolutely no zero can't will never can cannot even think of well then we're not being serious and if you build something i, I don't know about take it over i'll be serious yeah what's that i said again? if you build something then they're just gonna infiltrate it and take it over i and i'm like i'm like hey man there's no reason why 109 can't just be 110 right if it's happened yeah. 109 times and you're trying to say it can't happen 110 times then i don't know like I don't know which one of us is dealing with reality here. Or fine. Okay, they take it over and they and they do the thing. Okay, then we go, thanks. Uh, oh, shit, that sucks. Oh, well, yeah. go over to the next place. Rebuild. Yep. Like, we're, we're going to keep building. We're going to force them to spend more capital taking us over and, and hurting us than, in, than it's going to be worth. At some point, they'll either just give up or we'll win. So, because mm -hmm. we just don't stop. We're civils. We build. Why? Because we're civils. That's just what we do. <laughs> we, we'll do it in incarceration. We'll do it in. We'll do it in gulags. We'll do it. We'll do it. You know, if you put us on the moon, we'll put wherever you put us. As soon as we get a chance, we're gonna put start putting some sticks together, man. Like we're gonna start building something. If I get some input in here, then I'd like to vote for beyond the ice wall. But you know, I'll I'll, I'll take anything. I, you know. Uh, middle of the sea we got barges whatever man like let's i've got a contact for that <laughs> right okay do you want to get to the reading uh i just need to i'm going to duck out for a second because i'm going to get the daughter has my, my producer my daughter has just joined the uh joined the chat uh i'm just going to get her something quick to eat uh so if you would like to start us off matthew mm -hmm. with patchwork the political system for the 21st century chapter two Profit strategies for our new corporate overlords. And I will return in a minute. I think I can share my screen on this end here. So I'll do that. Did it work? Hopefully that worked. Hey, there it is. Look at that. Okay, perfect. All right. Patchwork, a political system for the 21st century. Chapter two, profit strategies for our new corporate overlords. Mencius Boldbug, November 20, 2008. Again, I'd like to highlight this was over 15 years ago that he's making these observations, which is genuinely remarkable. Say what you want about Moldbug, like the fact that he understood what was happening and saw what was coming and started predicting this stuff 15 years ago is, it's got to earn him some credit in my mind. I fear chapter one, after promising an absence of grim, dumped a can of it down your shirt. I apologize for this, dear readers, and also for the awful incendiary closing cliffhanger. But fear not, we will answer the question. You are has never been an easy ride, but I really don't mean to abuse the customer in this way. If nothing else, it repels the good and attracts the bad. 
But unfortunately, for those who are bored with these warm, gaseous exhalations, I've come to the conclusion that it is simply not possible to get into the meat of a UR post without a fresh introduction to the anti-democratic and, frankly, authoritarian philosophy of government for which we are so notorious. You do know that just reading this blog makes you a bad person, don't you? Unless you are a hardened, longtime reader, UR is just off your political map, and anyone can click on a blog for the first time. Besides, one can never be too deprogrammed. Most people, when they take a whack at designing a government, an engineering task at which all God's chillins just naturally excel. Uh, most people, when they take a whack at designing a government, an engineering task at which all God's chillins just naturally excel, tend to ask themselves, what should the government do? Of course, this is the wrong question. The right question is, what will the government do? A great example of asking the right question, but still getting the wrong answer, is Federal Federalist Number 10 by James Madison. It is almost funny to read Madison's bogus remedies for the well-known ills of democracy, such as national size being an infallible nostrum against political parties, not unlike perusing some medieval pharmacopoeia which prescribes dried wolf dick for breast cancer. For example, most democratic citizens are firm believers in the concept of limited government. In the all-carrying magic black bag of democracy, limited government is the first-line ointment. Apparently, a government can prevent itself and its successors indefinite from doing bad things just by writing a note to itself that says, don't do bad things. Follow swallowing the red pill, departing the matrix, and donning our alien-detecting Ray-Bans, we realize at once that no government can limit itself. Limited government is a perpetual motion machine, a product axiomatically fraudulent by definition. In any human organization, final authority rests with some person or persons, not with any rule, process, or procedure. I think this paragraph right here was the thing that permanently cured me of the notion of limited government and immediately, swim it, immediately swung me around to the notion of the necessity of unlimited government. <laughs> uh, okay. This is not to say that there is no distinction between Washington and Pyongyang. What we call the rule of law is a good thing. But if you have an efficient engine, there is no point in marketing it as an infinitely efficient engine. The noble ideal of limited government or rule of law is a piece of political camouflage behind which lurks a useful and effective, but certainly imperfect and not even slightly divine corporate design, that of judicial supremacy. In a, sen in a sentence, juridical supremacy is judicial supremacy. Judicial supremacy is a management design in which ultimate sovereign authority rests with committees of arbitrators who are experts in proper government procedure. The design certainly has its merits. If implemented well, for example, it can reduce personal graft among employees to negligible levels. Hardly a high standard, but I am happy to be governed by a regime which has achieved it. But ultimately, judicial supremacy can become arbitrarily evil. All it takes is arbitrarily evil judges. Is judicial, is judicial supremacy, for example, superior to military supremacy? This is like asking if a rowboat is better than a sailboat. For some purposes, it is. For some, it isn't. In peacetime, you would probably rather have the former. If you want to win a war, you probably want the latter. Neither, however, can be said to be, in any sense, predictable by design. A judicial critocracy or military dictatorship may deliver good government or bad government. Either can be nice or nasty. In the end, the words judge and general are just words. It is not at all difficult to imagine a process of political evolution by which they swap meanings. Er, oh my God, I have to try to pronounce this. Er Tofel, Tofelsdruck. Er Tofelsdruck's philosophy of clothes has never been, has never said more. Can a general command in a black robe or a justice be laid down in camo? Most assuredly. And the devil too in either, but more of him in short. Under the clothes is a man. Who is he? How got he here? What does he at his desk? None of these having too much to do with your design. None of well, these having much to do with your design. And this is this is where the regio really comes in. We're talking about the regio of, of civilizational capital. And just to give a, a brief explanation, that, that regio can usually mean region. But it can also mean uh, king, or and and there's a, there's obviously connections with religion. It's essentially that which binds. So you need to have this binding agent that is basically agreed upon, pre-agreed upon as your preposition. Like your starting preposition is we are this thing, we are this thing, and we always will be this thing. We we look like this, we function like this. This is how we are. 
I've used the example, like if you zoom out, the French and Italian are basically the same, but you zoom in, their differences begin to magnify extremely. And, you know, they occupy very similar geographic areas in, in, in the world. They have you know, food and wine cultures. They have, uh, you know, their language comes from, from Latin. There's a lot of connective tissues, but the French are the French and the Italians are the Italians, uh, or at least they used to be. And that distinction is very important because it's, it, it tells your people how and how to act. You think of it like the rule of law, there's rules and laws. You can substantiate laws and those are formal and those are your, your taboos. Essentially you do this, you go to jail or you pay a fine. Um, you have a comment about that finding if, 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 if the crime only has a fine attached to it, it's not really a crime. Um, but anyways, right. But anyways, uh, the rules, however, don't have to have a list. You don't necessarily get one. It's just, you kind of just get a, again, that vibe, like, no, no, we don't do that here. There's always those uh, videos of, um, of, uh, certain Americans who go over to Japan and start acting foolish and Japanese people just come over and go, yeah, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that here. <laughs> and they're just random people, you know, who are protecting, who are like basically the antibodies of the civilization who come in and go, this is no, we, we don't they're, act. They're Bucky's customers. Yeah. Ex well, exactly. They're Bucky's customers. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a vibe where it's not saying that these things couldn't possibly happen or that no Japanese person's ever gotten drunk on a train before. It's that these things get dealt with mm -hmm. and they're not allowed. They're not tolerated in any way, shape or form. It doesn't have to be necessarily Singapore harsh. But there has to be some response. If there's no response, you get British Airways uh, shit and piss airlines. That's the problem, right? That the degradation between that two, those two points is really just like graffiti on the wall. Oh, you allow that. Or, oh, the bathrooms are, aren't as clean. Someone's not really doing their job anymore. Or, you know, just little tiny things that begin to eat away at that regio. And it begins to erode of what you are and i and i i say in the modern world individualism nominalism liberalism whatever you have you is is that worm is that integral degradation because you get a whole bunch of people thinking well no i'm important i i'm i'm i i have liberty i must be free of my job i must be able to assert my 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 personality my oneness into the world so you know screw your standards uh you know uh, what, what what are clean bathrooms anyways like that seems to be white supremacist that's uh, oppressive that's screwing my sense of liberty okay well good luck with that because all you end up getting is shit and piss airlines <laughs> like th that's the, there's your drop off point because you start to allow things that don't belong there it's a it's a war on identity that's how liberalism it functions as mm. civilizational acid because it's a war on identity and what is identity 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 is like an externalized concept that you compare yourself to that you you relate to and that other people relate to you and you don't you don't control your identity you can you can change it you can affect it but you don't control it because ultimately that identity is hosted in the minds of other people you're so this is why a french person recognizes a french person because it's like we have the same identity and that identity implies a way that we act we act like french people there's an understanding that French people act and behave in a certain way and Spanish people act and behave in a certain way and British people act and behave in a certain way. And so when I'm British, that means I'm someone who acts like a British person. If I'm a son, it means I'm someone who acts like a son. If I'm a father, it means I'm someone who acts like a father. If I'm a brother, I act like I, I'm someone who acts like a brother. And those, those, each of those identities then has its own set of values. And these values are, 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 they're, they're values that have been revealed to us. We didn't create them. These values exist. They're latent within the identity. This is why you have, you have responsibilities, not rights. You have, you have the right to fulfill the responsibility that's accorded to your, um, your identity. And this is where, from the very beginning of the Bible, the first task that man is given is naming the animals establishing the identities, creating the order, the structure, the, 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 the standards. This is the fundamental masculine responsibility is creating identity in the world. 
which is recognizing the identity that is latent within it, given when you have the proper frame and you have a, 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 a um, an inbuilt understanding, you have the spirit of God, you have an inbuilt understanding of what reality is and what your relationship is to it. And that's the thing you have to, you can't have a civilization that doesn't have that by definition. By definition, a civilization is a group of people who have that, that common identity that they all recognize themselves as subordinated to. They're each an individual instantiation of that identity, so they have an individual identity, but that individual identity is subordinated to the collective identity, which is what provides it, which is what it allows, what allows it to be an identity in the first place. So a civilization is necessarily collective. So a collection of individuals, by definition, cannot be a civilization. It yeah, will necessarily it's, it's, be uncivilized. It's the Tower of Babel idea. When you insert globalization, you create mush. And you it, it, so Dave, uh, David Gronowski uh, is coming on uh, the channel in March, hopefully with you, Matt, as well, uh, where we can lay out some of these things on his feet and see what he does with it. He mentioned that there's a war on differentiation. Differentiation... Um, in the Girardian sense is like that sense of what is and what isn't like borders, you know, you are this and this is, so this is this and this, the reason why this is this is all the things that make it this and all the things that don't make it this, like you have to have the two things. That's the separation of forms. When you start to meld these things in together and to create this mush, that's when like men become women and women become men or, well, there is like, you know, well, there is no uh, originating uh, nation all, or all those things are bad. And what's good is this uh, continental mush that where everyone's just everyone. And, uh, and, and so everyone's everything and nothing at the same time. This is, you know, again, going back to how I liberalism is a Gnostic factory. It returns everyone back to this sense of one, right? Mm -hmm. We are, we are one, but the problem about becoming one is that you lose you. So in a weird way, defending individualism is just going to make you a mush person. You're going to lose mm -hmm. your identity as you defend your individualism. It's, and you can see this happening too thing. because the people, there's a reason the NPC meme exists. Because the people who are um, becoming the most mushed through the, the embrace of liberalism are becoming more and more undifferentiated from each other. They all think the same way. They all talk the same way. They, they all dress the same way. They are all becoming like one another. And this is a, an observation um, from, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, David Patrick Harry at Church of the Eternal Logos. He pointed out that it, the, under, the orthodox understanding of theosis, you know, God became man, man might become God. You, we are divinized through our participation in the energies of God. By participating in the life of Christ, we are divinized. The opposite of that, moving away from Christ is losing your humanity because Christ is the perfect human. He is a human and he's the perfect human. So if you want to become the perfect human, you must become like God because God is the perfect human. To be moving, to move away from God is to become less and less human, which is to become more and less and less differentiated and more, um, you're losing your personhood, your personhood. Your the thing that differentiates you is, is found in God. This, so this is why the, the, this was the, the Trinity solving the problem of the one of the many. I didn't even know what the problem of the one of the many was until someone explained to me how the Trinity solved it. And then once I understood what the one of the many was, I was like, oh, this is everything. This is this is like every single conflict, every single like political thing. It all come, it all reduces down to this that the dialectic tension between the one and the many collapses into modalism. Which is how all of the, this is why everything is Gnostic. All of these things all wind up tying in together. And this is why the Trinity is such a powerful, um, I almost, it's not an archetype, but I, speaking in it linguistically, once you recognize this pattern of the Trinity in reality, you see it's everywhere. It, it's, it's not that Orthodox Christianity is like numerical, numerolo numerological esotericism, it's that numerological esotericism is biting off of Orthodoxy. The mm -hmm. Trinity is a is a fundamental structure of reality that you see all throughout the hierarchy of the church. It's in the structure of the family. It's in the structure of communities themselves. You've talked about Marshall McLuhan's, um, uh, the medium is the message, and mm -hmm. but it's missing that third part, which is well, it's it's assuming the third part. It's always been mm -hmm. assuming the third part, which is the audience. 
uh, which they in media studies from that time period, or I guess now nowadays even they call it the phantom. So the the audience becomes assumed because they didn't have access to the audience. Uh, they just they, they would just make a thing and know that well people listen to the radio. So here's a radio show for people who listen to the radio, and radio shows are done this way. That's the medium is the message, you know. Um, where we now have this technology of streaming, where we don't have to assume the audience. The audience is in the room with us. Where the audience is interactive. The audience can, if we wanted to, we could turn it over to the audience and have the audience direct or produce the show if we wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. So by 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 confirming the audience, you create a trinity. And when I when I when I now I would say the operating modality for for media now is connection. It always has been. Here's a crazy thing: that's always been the key, but it, you had to assume it. Now it's confirmed. So by saying what we really are selling here is connection. It's the same thing with when we're dealing with civilizational capital. Like, like it's like what? Okay, what are we doing and why? Why this? Couldn't there be another way of doing this? And it's like, no, I don't think so. That the the fundamental thing that you're doing produces this. If you're if when you have competence, you have capital. When you have media, you have connection. It's all about connection. And either you're and either you're doing it purposefully or other people will build it for you. Proof proof of this, uh, Walking Dead viewing parties or Game of Thrones uh, viewing parties where they would send in and, and shows would actually sometimes change depending on massive uh, audience uh, res res response. How, or Heroes was one of the first, I think one of the first shows who did that. They changed our whole entire se mm -hmm. uh, second or third season. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Disastrously yeah. so. But like, so there's yeah. We can look at the the failure rate on this as well. But but that was when they were starting to play around with. Hey, we have this audience who's mass watching this, binge watching this, getting together, having watch parties. You know, talking to people in the office. This becomes a whole culture of the show. That's connection, and whether you're doing it on purpose or people people do it themselves, it doesn't matter. You you have it. You have, and that's to me. There's human capital. Now imagine if Game of Thrones was able to take that human capital when they had at their peak and convert it and make and start making building towns out of it or doing whatever they wanted with it. Like it's not just the problem is that people get this idea of like we just make more show. Oh, really big important, uh, really big uh, popular show. Therefore, make more show, make more show, make more popularity, so on and so on. Well, there's always a glass ceiling to this. My example is like Aaron McIntyre in our circle is one of the most successful, well-known figures we, we can think of, right? Like easily in the last, I don't know, whatever, four or five years. He's got 35,000 subscribers on YouTube, 100, over 100,000 on X, only 35,000 on YouTube. That's crazy to me. And then you think of people in our in our sphere who are like, you know, with aspirations of being like the new Fox News. I'm like, dude, the mo one of the most successful guys who's really smart and really well and really well produced and is is now work with the Blaze and has this whole entire infrastructure and is is like doing things that you only kind of wish you could do. Only has thirty five thousand pe people. Like the change between the so I'm not and I'm not and he, and he's a guy who should have three point two. But then you look at people who are having million dollar, uh, million, uh, million uh, uh, member subscriptions on uh, on on YouTube, canceling their channel after ten years. There's a whole phenomenon. Okay, one guy had like seventeen million. One channel had seventeen million. Just they just they just quit because they realize at some point it's like you're not converting this. There's no conversion rate of this capital. All you're doing is just saying, well, we make more show then, more show, make more show. And that's fine and great, and I and if that's what you want to do, God bless and please, you know, do what you want. But Mr. Beast is proving that that theory too. Where it's like make more show, but take more take that show and do things with it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree with Mr. Beast. You don't want Mr. Beast model. Great. I uh, I think the guy's a bit creepy too. But like, but look at what he's doing, right? He's copy. He's oh, he's successful. Great. Take the success and then figure out why that's working. You know, what are the mechanisms at play? Can you can you manufacture those me mechanisms in your way? Make them better. You don't, you know, uh, company towns. This is uh, quite often, I think, the... And I thought this Im immediately with what, you know, the idea of converting 
digital capital into into meat space capital by building towns. And the first thing I thought of was like, oh, is this building a, a better mousetrap? Are we just building better company towns? And then I had to sit down and go, okay, but what's the problem with that? Like what what's inherently, excuse me. Uh, I need a self-closing door. Uh, what's inherently wrong? It's we, we asked this question about what's wrong with serfdom. I'm not endorsing it, but what's really wrong with it? Like, what's your problem with it, really, fundamentally? It's the same thing with company towns. Like, well, we look at the mining thing of the 1920. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, let's just put it in a neutral space. What's the bad thing about that? That it's owned and operated by a town? Okay, well, if you have a home office, if you're a YouTuber and you make videos for a living and you sit at home and make videos, you're you're in you you have a company town. Like this is like right. you your live home where is you a company work, town. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now imagine if you had any, oh, do you have a library in your house? Do you have like, okay, so, and you own it. So that's, I guess the, the benefit, but you own it, the bank owns it and you're just paying mortgage or whatever and you're paying your taxes. So it doesn't get taken away from you, but you, so, okay, just maximize that into a town. What, what's the problem? What if, what if it was just Jason town that I could just take all this capital of the show and, and buy up everything around me and then just run it and say, yeah, it's my town now. And it's run by my principal. And I just do deals with other towns to make sure I can continue existing. Like, th that's the thing, right? Like, yes, we can look at historical precedents and, and look for warning signs and try to veer it off. And bad people are going to do bad things with things. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. But it doesn't mean that we can't also do good things with them. And that's, you know, so I, sorry, I, I know that was a, wild tangent but i i feel i feel like that has to be expressed on some level because i know quite often some of the pushback i get from it seems to be people who think they're being rational about things but all they're really doing is telling me that i don't want to do anything i i would mm -hmm. i would rather i will go live in the pod i will eat the bugs but i will bitch and complain about it the entire time and that makes me righteous in principle i won't like it you know oh i'm gonna be the one that doesn't doesn't like it <laughs> right <laughs> one interesting, one, like, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah. one kind of related thought is uh, I was listening to uh, Alex Ramosi once as he was talking about what he does um, if he invests in somebody's business. Because part one of his models with acquisition.com is he brings in people people who are above a certain income threshold. They can apply and then he's he'll go in and he takes, I think he said, a 19% stake in the company. And then his he has the whole company built around taking their company, overhauling it and, and blowing it up. Um, fantastic, brilliant business model. His, his goal is to surpass Warren Buffett, and I'm sure he's probably going to. Um, one of the things he talked about is his his approach to, uh, with a company like that, um, or even just, if you're thinking not even in terms of taking over a company and doing this with the company itself, you can even think of the audience. You have your 100% of people that you are are dealing with, whether it's the 100% of the employees in the company, 100% of the employees in a particular division of the company, or 100% of the audience. And in every case, the principle is the same. Of that 80, of that 100 rather, you're going to have a, a Pareto distribution. So 80% are going to be below average. They're going to be the customers you don't want, the employers, you, employees you don't want, the ones who are unproductive, the ones that are never going to do anything. So they're just passive. They're just consumers, yada, yada, yada. What you want to do is you want to identify who that 80 are because then that'll tell you who the 20 are. You find out who your who your 20 are, and then you start engineering, whether it's your show, your your business, your um, your 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 client base, you start making the moves necessary to make your hundred percent that out of that 20%. Take that 20% and find um the the same number as the 80% of the people who are like the 20%. Once you've done that, then you do the same thing again and you're whittling down to the higher and higher value people. Because if you have 20 really high value people, that's worth vastly more than 80 low value people. So using the principle of like Mr. Beast, his his content appeals to like the lowest common denominator possible. It's it's primed for absolute mass marketing. So grading on a curve and accounting for that, how imagine if Mr. Beast's, I don't know, he has 100 million subscribers or whatever. Imagine if his 100 million subscribers were instead of being a hundred million of a distribution across mostly the lower end of the of society's bell curve, if you could swap out all of those 
and have a hundred million of just the high end of the bell curve and have an audience like that. You could do the same thing if it's your clients. It could be the city that you're trying to form. You build in mechanisms like that where there's an actual selection effect and you target intentionally the high value people, recognizing you're going to, when you, when you, when you, when you cast out into the world, you're going to attract the 80%. They're going to be there. Deal with it. Recognize it. You're looking for that 20%. And when you have that 20%, then you, you need to create a mechanism whereby you can take that 20% and pull them in somewhere. And then from within that 20%, find the 20% that you can take further. And this is a natural selection filtering mechanism whereby you can you can find really high value people because once you get a collection of really high value people, those people together, you could have 20 of them and they're going to be able to outproduce 8 million of the low value people, particularly with the, the leverage of technology at our disposal now. Oh yeah, for sure. Like the 10x effect is is real, is very, very real. And especially nowadays where you know, if you're a high valued, intelligent, go getting person, and the majority of your day is spent on online or in real life, spent around like slugs of human beings, I can understand the resentment that builds up. My thing is that like, we don't have to be resentful. We just have to separate. Mm -hmm. We have to go. There's people who are living in a primal frame, and people living in a civil frame. I want the people living in the civil frame as a starting as a starting ground, and there'll be a hierarchy within that too. But I, I would I would much rather work with let's say uh, a lower value person who's operating in a civil frame than a high valued primal frame person. Right. Because a high value primal frame person is my enemy. Yes. Like that is literally the most that that's the person who I must take arms against intellectually, physically, whatever. That's your public. Those enemy. are people who. Right. Because those are people who who want to come in and take our stuff aggressively mm -hmm. the the low value primal people just kind of follow the herd they're like they're they're like locusts like they just they just show up somewhere the high valued primal praying person is going to tell them where to go eat and that's those are the people i gotta we have to worry about you know uh so so that's the why the distinction is really important, I think, to get through to people is that if you operate in a civil frame and that I, I want to work with you, like I'm much more interested in you than anything else. And if there's only 10 million people like that, great. Give me 10, 25,000. I don't know what, whatever the number is. Fine. Give me that 25,000 uh, rather than give me 2.2 .2 million of primal people like of Jake Paul's listeners know, or whatever. <laughs> Right. And then, and then I, and then I got to do what? Like convert them to a civil frame. Like th that would take my entire life and it, it <laughs> yeah. probably wouldn't work anyways. Right. Like what uh -huh. a misuse of capital that would be. Um, got to start wrapping up a little bit cause I got to get the girl ready for pool. Do you want to do a little mm -hmm. bit more reading and then we, uh, sure. we can put a pin in this for till next time. All right. Am I still, yeah, I'm still screen sharing. Okay. Is it possible to design a structure of government which will be stable and predictable? Hopefully, of course, stably and predictably benign. History offers no evidence of it, but history affords no evidence of semiconductors either. There is always room for something new. The key is that word should. When you say your government should do X or should not do Y, you are speaking in the hieratic or priestly language of, dem of democracy. You are postulating some ethereal and benign higher sovereign which can enforce promises made by the mere government to whose whims you would otherwise be subject. In reality, while your government can certainly promise to do X or not to do Y, there is no power that can hold it to this promise. Or if there is, it is that power which is your real government. Your whining should be addressed to it. The neo cameralist structure of patchwork realms, which are sovereign joint stock companies, creates a different kind of should. This is the profitable should. We can say that a realm should do X rather than Y because X is more profitable than Y. Since sovereign means sovereign, nothing can compel the realm to do X and not Y. But with an anonymous capital structure, we can expect administrators to be generally responsible and not make obvious stupid mistakes. I'm not <laughs> is that what you do when... Is that what you do when someone invites you to the beach? <laughs> no. What I, when, when, what I do when someone invites me to the beach is I look them in the face and I'm like, no. And then I, 
And if they keep persisting, I tell them all the reasons why I hate the beach. And usually that means I don't get invited anymore. <laughs> you can be left at home to keep to yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can be downright uh well you know you've you've been in voice chats with me. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Encounter it was, uh, and I... exceptional and difficult to get along with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know him. He's me. <laughs> I'm a I'm a venture capitalist in the making, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of South Africans are gonna <laughs> love me. <laughs> Another way to say this is that a realm is financially responsible. <clears throat> the general observation here is that, to paraphrase Tolstoy, financially responsible organizations are all alike. By definition, they do not waste money. By definition, their irresponsible counterparts do. And by definition, there are an infinite number of ways to waste money. Think of a rope. A financially responsible organization is a tight rope. It only has one shape. But if there is slack in the rope, it can flap around in all kinds of crazy ways. It is immediately clear that the neocameralist should, the tightrope, is far inferior to the ethereal should, the magic leash of God. Typically, these days arriving in the form of vox populi, vox dei, or as a cynic might put it, vox populi, vox percepturis, which means um, uh, like the voice of the teacher, the voice of the preceptor, instructor, tutor, commander, ruler. Given the choice between financial responsibility and moral responsibility, I will take the latter every time. If it were possible to write a set of rules on paper and require one's children and one's children's children to comply with this Bible, all sorts of eternal principles for good government and healthy living could be set out. But we cannot construct a political structure that will enforce moral responsibility. We can construct a political structure that will enforce financial responsibility, thus neocameralism. We might say that financial responsibility is the raw material of moral responsibility. The two are not by any means identical, but they are surprisingly similar, and the gap seems bridgeable. When we use the profitable should, therefore, we are in the corporate strategy department. We ask, how should a patchwork realm or any other or any financially responsible government be designed to maximize its maximize the return on its capital? Let's put a pin in there. Let's put a pin in okay. there because um, we're coming up on the hour and a half. Uh, uh, any last thoughts on this one before we do a bit of a wrap? And uh, and get you. You're, 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 I guess you're watching the Super Bowl this this this. Oh uh, yeah, I might. I've I've still got a bunch of work I have to do, so I'll probably be watching it with one eye. Um, I think uh, the one thing that I would say is obviously Moldbug writing this. I mean, as anybody will tell you, Moldbug is a Jew, um, and he's he's writing this from the from a from a secular perspective. He has definitely has an appreciation and an understanding for um for religious principles. And, and honestly, I think if you like, if you gave him a truth serum, like he would probably see himself broadly as Christian and respecting Christian values, um, wanting to live in a society that express Christian values essentially. Um, however, he's recognizing this problem here that you can't, um, the, even theocracies don't work. Like you don't want to have mm -hmm. a theocracy. Government is a service is a service that's provided by people. And you need that to be a good service. You can't force it to be a good service. Because if you were to force it to be a good service, then you would be the government yourself. And then the same question now is, is applied to you. So all you can do is seek to build this service the same way you would build any other service. Construct it to run efficiently and profitably. And then the, 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 the secondary problem is or I guess it would be the primary problem, but you can come up with the model, you can come up with the structure, but then you need to populate that structure with people who are going to be good, which is something mm -hmm. you can't force. This is this is the problem. This is the thing. This is the developing the civilizational grind set is becoming the people who can populate an institution like that and run that institution not just financially responsibly but morally responsibly. If you have a financially irresponsible company, you can't run it morally responsibly. You can't be financially irresponsible and morally responsible as well. But if you get yeah, a financially we, responsible company, then you're going to have a strong incentive to be morally responsible as well. The tie back to Bombardier versus Bucky's. You know, mm -hmm. Bucky's can can make certain decisions that on paper uh, you were saying that no 18 wheeler is allowed. Um, that's a that's a not a strictly a, a financial choice. That's a, a well, let's say moral choice. But 
it, it's a choice. It's a choice of simply saying like, we understand the consequences of, um, of this action of what this could potentially do to us. Therefore, we're going to say no to it and just not have that and not have the, and not have all those problems. Now we don't have those revenues, but we don't have the problems either. So we're, we're, we're fine with that. Right. And again, it's a differentiation. Everyone else has that. They all, and they have all those problems or potentially have all those problems that they have to keep, you know, uh, fixing for. We're just going to just exclude that altogether. Um, and do this other thing. Bombardier didn't do that. They just kept accepting more and more and expanding more and more past the point of where their their competency could can maintain that capital. And that began to erode both quality, uh, service, goods, and ability to fulfill those orders to the point where they're now, I mean, a shell. Uh, I'm sure the, you know, Forbes is trying to paint this beautiful picture, but it's like, dude, I mean, come on. Like, you don't go from standing shoulder to shoulder with Boeing to becoming like a private jet manufacturer. I'm the sure they're on the cusp of being bought decade. out completely. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, or they limp along as this like micro, like imagine, you, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a balkanization effect where you mm -hmm. take, you take a, a company that a civilization has grown itself into a, into an empire almost. And now has had to shrink back down to the, to the British Isles. Like, it's not that this is bad. I mean, sure. I mean, a lot of, a lot of companies who might dream to be a private jet uh, company, they're starting from zero. That's their one, you know? Uh, but to go from 10 to, to one is, is a severe drop off. And, and if you, if you failed as a generalist, then it's not, it's not an, an ignoble thing to, um, strive to succeed as a specialist. Right. Exactly. To go from the repair shop to the aerospace engine, uh, company is massive. That's the idea of going from a small colony to a world global superpower, essentially, or something, or something close to it. But to go from a world superpower, look at the Soviet Union, to go from the, you know, number two or neck and neck to, to collapsing into, into, you know, uh, the Russian Republic Federation, whatever you want to call it for the first 30 years, wasn't, it wasn't pretty there. It was hard. You know, they, they went through economic hardship. They went through a demoralization process that they already been experiencing under Sovietism. But you get my point. Like it, it, it's look at the British, look at like, lots of places in Europe who just feel like empty shells that have sold off all their capital and now are just living in this remnants of this, of this once great civilization that they don't eat, can't reproduce. Um, it's, it's sad, but it's also, it, then you look at Bucky's and you go, but it's hopeful because you can, from the, from the reverse, you can build. And when, when you start building, if you're building something competently, you're going to attract competent people because competent people want to find other competent people. So you start attracting those competent people and you get a compounding effect, which means I don't need Bucky's to be run by an Orthodox Christian. I don't even need mm -hmm. Bucky's to be run by a Christian at all. Bucky's could be run by a raging atheist. But if that raging atheist wants to go wants to to govern a territory competently and effectively, and he wants to attract competency and he wants to do competent things, then that suits my interests and I'm happy to cooperate with him. And the stuff that we're talking about here is not, we're, we're talking in theory, but we're not restricting ourselves to theory. We're telling you, we're telling you guys what we're going to do. We're telling you guys what we're building toward. We're giving you like the, the, the background or our, our thought process in going into this. Cause we recognize we're going to need people to help with along with this process. It's, it's going to take a village, so to speak. So we want to put this out here so you guys can can understand and start getting on our same same wavelength. And if you recognize where we're going, you think it's somewhere you want to go as well, then we want to get on your radar. We want you we want you to be attracted to what we're doing to be able to participate and help us in this process. Matt, don't you have a a, a little Discord group that uh, is collecting some of these fine some some fine people and some some Wymans as well, but some <laughs> fine people are, are joining that group. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yes. We uh we have a a fine Discord group that uh, my good friend here Jason is an active member in. We spend a lot of time in the voice chats there. Just I mean, if you enjoy sitting here and watching us talk about this kind of stuff, I, I don't know who would enjoy just sitting and watching us, but apparently somebody does. If you would enjoy that and you want to be a part of the conversation, you could start you could ask us questions, you could tell us we're stupid, you could you could do whatever you want. 
you can come just jump, jump in the voice chat with us. It's, it's exactly like a conversation like this, except we go for three to six hours and there's a bunch of different people and we just talk back and forth and come up with ideas and everything. So um, subscribe star.com slash King pilled will get you in for now. Um, we're uh, I had a long, a fairly long conversation with someone today on a particular project that fits into our overall game plan and scheme here that we're going to start working on. And it's going to be a cooperative community project. It ties in very much with the idea of Bucky's as say, say Bucky's running a city. Imagine an entire city that's owned and operated by Bucky's and what that would look like and how we could create the circumstances where something like that might be possible. So if this is a project you want to get involved with, then subscribe to com slash King to come join the King Pill discord. That sounds like a company town, Matt. Company towns are bad. Why would you want to live in a, why would you want to live in a town that has the world's great cleanest washrooms? That sounds like that's 1930s Germany or something. You mean I? You mean I might not be able to pretend that I'm just like some sovereign uh, individual here? I might have to subordinate myself to community values. You can no, pretend we're shit lips here. Yeah, well, you can pretend whatever you want as long as, you're, yeah, right. as long as you show up to work and, and put <laughs> put the hours in. You fucking go home and wear a dress dude i don't look <laughs> have whatever fantasies you would like as long as you recognize that that's what they are <laughs> one of the more controversial things about me is i don't wear shorts out in public and the reason why is because my grandfather when i was quite young who's one of the more based people you uh, fortunately will never be able to meet but just you gotta take me uh, on my word here i didn't come from nothing um he once told me that shorts are for uh are for children women and queers and that men don't wear shorts out in public. Now, at home, you know, that's a different thing. You're at home. You're in your confines. You paid for this motherfucker. You can, if you want to wear shorts at home, you go right ahead. But out in public, no, sir, you wear pants. Why? Because you're a grown adult, and that's how you present yourself. That's it. Now, I know this is controversial for Matt. <laughs> who... Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I wear almost exclusively shorts and flip flops, except for special occasions whenever I'm outside. So I'm having to figure out whether I'm a woman, a child, or a queer. We'll, we'll find out. Possibly all all the above. You never know, man. <laughs> it's like it's like changing weather in Texas. Yeah, you could, you, yeah could, right. you could go. You could run the gambit. You know, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking this out. We're going to run this on the private, uh, the members only, friends are fed. A members portal for two dollars i let people know about it it's going to be up here for a few days and i'll put it out for general consumption i'll make some edits where i'm picking my nose when uh, matt you le you left for a second to fix the audio problems uh uh, uh was it what's what's the euphemism um uh exceptional but difficult to get along with <laughs> yeah right no my farts uh thank you folks Depending when you're listening to this, we got uh, we got some. Oh, I'll just say we have some really good guests coming up. Uh, month of March, we uh, March first, we're putting together the Pay PayPal Mafia Friend or Fed uh, with our dear friend Matt here, who's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting because he's been doing most of that research. And uh, I'm just going to sit back and direct traffic. We have uh, we're waiting for some confirmations, but um, that could be a, a really big one. Uh, and then throughout the month of March, going into Lent. Uh, we'll be doing talking to a few more Orthodox uh, personages and uh, having some good times with that as we continue to build and push this concept out and see what other people can do with it. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for loving and sharing and doing all the things with the show. Uh, go join the King Pill Discord or at least sub subscribe to Matt. Uh, but don't forget to subscribe to us first. He just hit 2,000 subscribers. Congratulations. Uh, I am like... 500 less than 500 away from you so i'm depending on your team we'll, we'll catch up Just patch catch up and over and overtake this king pilled guy this man made of hair <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very tom Selleck. i feel like i'm i'm feel like in the 1970s all over again uh my wife wants that. me to do just the mustache but oh yeah yeah but no, I, I was walking into the gas station today and a guy was walking out and he looked at me and then he doubled. He was like, and he goes, dude, you've got an amazing beard, man. And I was like, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you can shave the beard now. It's kind no. of brand. It's like the uh -huh. same thing. With my, I, I've had a mustache for a very long time. My grandfather had one. So I've been sporting this thing for a long time on and off. But 
uh, I've kind of settled on it now. Is like this is now this is me till I die phase, and uh, it'd be weird. It'd just be weird if I got I, I, my daughter wouldn't recognize me. <laughs> you should you should get someone thing. to make like a like a, a one of the art things of your where it's like the outline of your face kind of, and all you can see is the mustache, the glasses sort of down on your nose a little bit, and then the the headphones on with the mic mm. right in front of your face. It would be that would make a really cool little logo image. Mm, maybe <laughs> we'll we'll see. We're we're playing around with some different some changes on the channel, sirs and ma'ams and ladies and peoples and whatever and the hell you are. Queers and women and children wearing shorts. It's a wild, wild, wacky world, sir. I don't like it. No, sir. I don't like it at all. All right. Thanks again, guys. We'll talk again soon. See you guys.